Thanks very much. My name is Kerry Hayes. I'm the uh, Director of Public Relations at a uh, marketing and communications firm in Memphis called Doug Carpenter Associates. Um, and Tommy and I have been working on this uh, contribution that's really about... Um, uh, so I used to work at the mayor's office for about three years. Tommy is now on his second tour of duty working for the public sector. And one of the things that preoccupies us a lot is thinking about the fragility uh, not just of our own local government, but of all local governments, and how you know, really dwelling on how governments make decisions when it comes to place making and the sort of thinking or lack of thinking sometimes that goes into those investment decisions. So when I started working on this, I had this really clever idea that I was going to tell this entire thing through headlines, and then immediately that was sort of stupid. But anyway, uh, this first one is um, sort of speaks right to that issue uh, of value. And what you're saying, this is a guest column that a friend of mine submitted. Uh, late, late last year when our city council uh, reopened a conversation. They, they impaneled a task force to begin to discuss the feasibility of possibly studying a new convention center. And the blowback that they got was just really, really uh, fierce right away. And it's because uh, um, there's, a, there's a fragility to cities that is taking hold now that's really sort of scary. And it's happening uh, for a lot of discrete reasons. There's sort of four things that are happening in, in all local governments at once, it seems like. Uh, cities are, are, are increasing in population, so, so America is urbanizing faster and faster and faster. Um, the, the property values that were there before the Great Recession are gone and are very slowly coming back, so the tax revenues are not where cities would like them to be. Uh, Endless political gridlock at the federal level has caused a reduction in uh, appropriations and community development block grant dollars and other sources of revenue that cities used to use uh, for neighborhood investment. And um, all these things happening together are, uh, are, are putting cities in a real state of crisis. They don't have the revenues that they need to operate, much less to make really strategic investment decisions about um, uh, neighborhood level uh, investment. So the uh, to replace that revenue, they're sort of going back to, they're either creating really interesting partnerships with philanthropy, like we're seeing in Detroit, like we're seeing in Memphis to some degree, or they're using, you know, what Chuck Marone would call a mega project, or uh, what I would call infill sprawl. So that's issuing hundreds of millions of dollars in uh, municipal debt to build a new convention center, or a new shopping thing downtown, or a new sports stadium, or some other big project that all at once is going to create immediate and lasting prosperity, right? No. So that's why we're starting to see these really unusual uh, sort of political alliances of, you know, right-wing sort of deficit hawks and really, uh, you know, the you know, ultra-left-wing social justice crowd who would rather see that money spent in other ways uh, come together to push back on projects like this. So I can't give my friend all the credit for, like, stopping this convention center thing in, in its tracks, but it was, uh, we're having these sort of conversations now in the media and in the public that we weren't having before. And the good news is that there is a path out of this fragility into, into what we would consider to be a more uh, uh, agile mindset on the part of local government. And that sort of happens in three ways. And the first is uh, being honest, so taking a true look, a, a real candid assessment of some of the things that, that cities can uh, and should be doing. And that starts, obviously, with a conversation about the value of land. So I'm sorry that the one graphic I did put in here represents so poorly on the screen, but um, you're looking at a land productivity map of Memphis. And if you were to look closely, you'd see um, sort of on the left side where, the, where downtown is, uh, older, you know, dense, walkable neighborhoods that are still really productive, still potentially really, really productive from an ROI point of view. And then the red dots are sort of this like spatter pattern of capital improvement dollars that the city has just sort of scattered. So what we're seeing is a misalignment between where the city uh, can and is investing its resources and where it should be because they're not doing it in those places where they could see the highest return and once tools like this this was done two years ago I think Once data like this becomes more visible and cities are more willing to share this and these kinds of tools are more regularly uh, Seen uh, there's sort of this natural conversation that rises around why are you spending money here and not here where it could be doing a lot more good and then the city is able to sort of start to organize its partners and the sort of philanthropic community and the private sectors to, to start making places together that are really productive. And then when that happens, uh, density sort of naturally organizes itself. And the services that cities have to offer that are, that are measured in vehicle miles traveled, like trash pickup and police protection and these other things, they start to save money, which becomes a net positive for city government, which is a really, really awesome thing. And that opens the door to having a really exciting set of conversations around housing policy and economic development policy. And another headline that I used to illustrate my point is uh, earlier this year, our governor came into Memphis with this great announcement. Uh, there's going to be a new call center coming to Shelby County. 
it's going to bring a thousand jobs, and we have a really high unemployment rate. So a thousand jobs is better than not a thousand jobs. But a couple weeks into it, we, um, you know, the devil's in the details. So the thing is actually going to be built uh, right outside the city limits of Memphis, so the sort of the farthest northeast corner of our metro area. And to get to this place from the zip code for unemployment is highest it would take a two and a half hour bus ride. And that includes being on a leg of a bus line that the city is creating just to service this call center. So now, you know, when we're talking about subsidy versus investment, you know, this is the city uh, responding to uh, the offer of jobs that it's, uh, you know, are being obviously moved from some other part of the country, having to then subsidize this thing in a continuing way. Uh, that's just crazy. It's not, you're not developing, you're not producing anything of value. You're just sort of, you know, it, it's, it's the, the, the tail wagging the dog in a way that's really long-term unproductive. So you know, be honest, uh, be rational, uh, and then the last thing a city can do is to be nice. And by be nice, I mean in places where austerity has sort of forced the city to pull back, uh, we're seeing you know neighbor associations, sometimes single people or single families on blocks, take ownership over those places and do things. And I've been shocked um, since I've sort of been involved with this, even in the past few weeks. Um, you know, the tactical urbanism movement in Memphis is real, and it's growing, and it's becoming more and more productive, and I know it's happening in cities all over the country. And city governments have sort of yet to figure that out. That's sort of why we're doing this. This is our sort of message to local governments to say, you've got to sort of figure this out. And when these things are happening, uh, be it a temporary retail installation or a community garden or a gorilla bike lane or something, the city has can do sort of one of three things. They can immediately come in and try to crush it, right? And it's amazing when a city has no money Somehow they find money to come in and like sandblast a bike lane off of the street when somebody's painted it. Uh, or they can do nothing, which is its own kind of help, typically. Or they can sort of really pay attention and listen. And they sort of, you know, can start thinking about tactical urbanism as sort of the point of an arrow that's sort of showing them, hey, here's a neighborhood where there is a lot of opportunity. And here's where there are people who are trying to do things. And that's where the city can actually be of help by coming in and maybe making a public realm improvement permanent. Uh, being a little bit more permissive with a permitting or zoning uh, regulation than they need to be when, when some sort of retail establishment is trying to take place. Those are things they're not always doing now with any sort of uh, systematic uh, way and that they need to be. And so this is our sort of message not only to cities that they have to figure this out, but also to everybody in this room uh, who may not work for a city. You know, this is a conversation that we've got to keep having, and this is an advocacy charge that's going to require a lot of diligent work moving forward so that we can sort of start to work together and really start to create some value in our places where there's a lot of opportunity. Thanks.